just as we're getting started this afternoon. Thank you for coming. Uh, he is a freelance filmmaker and photographer based in Bainbridge Island near Seattle, Washington. Please welcome Matt Longmire. All right. Nice. Applause from the camera guy, too. Perfect. Uh, thank you. So I want to I start by pointing something out. Um, I am not... Uh, I have no problem with... Uh, the, our audience at the moment. And the reason I say that is there, there's actually a point to this. I, I always wish I could do the pitch of why captions are important before a class. Um, because half this class is about why it's important and the other half is how to do it. Captions aren't necessarily a very popular topic. Um, we, hence the, the size of the audience. This is not the first time I've, done, I've taught this class to uh, an audience like this. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's all about raising awareness. Ha like I said, most of what I'm doing right now is advocating. So I will talk to you and I will talk to the camera because this is the kind of thing that helps advocate for captions and subtitles. Um, do we have my slideshow thing? There we go. Make sure it's working. I can't remember if I turned it on or off. Ta -da, there we go. Okay. So uh, I call this the Indie Filmmaker's Guide to Captions and Subtitles. Um, and basically what that is is everything that's not typical broadcast media. Um, because usually any kind of cable or even local broadcast or um, anything that goes out to the public through our normal channels... Um, usually has their own teams of people who do captions and subtitles. So this is more for the indie filmmaker, the do-it-yourselfer. Um, if you're producing your own work or if you're filming or editing, um, this is all about both why this is important and how to do it. Um, now, you had mentioned that being from Brazil, you're really interested in being able to do multilingual uh, films and, and, and other projects. So this is going to help you a lot, especially when we start talking about subtitles. Um, and there is a difference between captions and subtitles, so it's why I list both as part of the title. So first, and this is for people watching um, as well, I'm going to, quote, prove my point. Um, we're going to talk about uh, this quote from George Lucas. The sound and music are 50% of the entertainment in a movie. That is pretty easy to accept. You know, we both see it and hear it. Uh, David Lynch says, films are 50% visual and 50% sound. Sometimes the sound even overplays the visual. Um, I recently saw the movie A Quiet Place, which was fantastic. I really loved it. Um, and their use of sound was incredible. I cannot wait to go back and watch that again with captions and see how they describe those things. Um, the, these quotes are sort of designed to help us understand why it's important to focus on sound. Most filmmakers, especially early filmmakers, tend to focus so much on what it looks like and we let the sound take a back seat, which puts it more at like a 70%, 30% split. Um, and while these quotes are designed to make us think more about sound as a key part of our project, um, they actually tell us something else, which is if you don't have the ability to hear these, you only get half of whatever was made. If you can't hear what's going on, you have no idea what a whole half of that project is doing unless you have captions. Um, I'm going <laughs> to, I can't see my notes, so I'm trying, I've done this class enough that I, I'm pretty good at it, but I, I'm going to make a guess here. The next thing I usually show is a demo. Um, and I always tell people to watch the demo and tell me exactly what they think of it. Oh, sorry, missed one. Let me go to the demo here. So this is my demo video. Fascinating, right? Can't hear anything. We have no idea what's going on, especially because this is a nonfiction project, so it's mostly talking heads. So we get a couple of basic ideas, but we have no idea what's actually happening to in this project. We don't know what they're talking about, which makes it impossible to follow, which means we turn it off, right? Um, going back to the slide that I had before, and these are American statistics, um, but... 15% uh, of American adults uh, age 18 and over report at least some trouble hearing. That's a, that's a pretty big portion of your audience. And one in eight people age 12 or older has complete hearing loss, no ability to hear. And like I said, these are American statistics, but it's, it's not, you know, because they're health-based, it's not far off depending on where you are. Um, so again, that's a, that's a pretty big chunk of your audience. Usually when I have eight people in a class, I say at least one of you 
there's a good chance that at least one of you can't fully hear what's going on. Um, so that tells us how important it is not just to think of our sound as part of our project, but also to think about our audience and who can hear this. Now, with captions and subtitles, there are essentially three main points. There is being able to expand your audience to the deaf and hard of hearing communities. There is the second portion, which is being able to expand your audience beyond English, or in your case, um, as many languages as you want. And then there's the third portion, which is, I hate to say it, that's usually the one that gets people doing this, and that's for search engine optimization, SEO. Um, because that's one we associate with marketing, and we associate marketing with getting more eyes on our project. So with search engine marketing, to give you an example, and I'll talk about it more in a minute, um, when you post a video to YouTube, you put the title in, you put the description in, uh, and the, all those words are indexed by Google and other search engines. Um, but let's say you do a project about dogs, and your title is The Life of a Dog, and the description talks about how great dogs are. But in your project, you talk a lot about pugs and French bulldogs and German shepherds and all these other kinds of dogs. Google has no idea you're talking about any of that because it doesn't have any text. It can't listen to sound, at least not yet. Maybe we'll, I'm sure we'll get there, but not yet. But if you give those, if you actually upload a captions file, which we'll talk about how to do that shortly, um, all those words, everything you said is now part of that. So if I go searching for German shepherds, there's a good chance if you talked about it enough, I'll see it as my, one of my results. So that's usually the one that convinces producers and, and filmmakers to go through with captions. Um, but going back to the part about non-English subtitles, hey, welcome. Come on in. We're having an intimate class. We're just keeping it. Yeah, we're keeping it small. I'm using the microphone anyway just because of recording. But welcome. I know you. I know you. There you go. See? Intimate class. I was just making my pitch about uh, the importance of sound and how some portions of audience, if they can't hear, they lose that. So that covers one of my bases, uh, which is how captions are important for the deaf and hard of hearing community. The second, as I was just talking about, um, subtitles, uh, which is more for foreign language, uh, is based on being able to expand your audience beyond the, the language of your film. I have a project that I did that does far better in France than it does in the, in the States. Uh, because it fits the genre of the kinds of films that they make. The U.S. couldn't care less, but France loves it. And I would look at my views, and, and it's only because I was able to translate those English subtitles into French, and they dig it. So that can be a big part of your audience as well. And in your case, you can have as many languages as you want, and I'll show you how to do it for really, really cheap. So, and the third part being SEO. So all, those, all the words in your project get indexed. Yep, that's the really big one. All right. So going forward, this, uh, this is just going back to the demo of what is a project like if you can't hear it. And talking about the non-hearing impaired, why would anybody who uh, speaks the language of the project and yet has no hearing problems whatsoever, why would they turn on captions and subtitles? Um, that's one of them. That's definitely one of them. I have two and a half year old twins. And when they go to sleep, I watch a movie with captions on to keep that volume down. So uh, some of the recent statistics from Facebook, YouTube, Amazon are that 80% of the viewers uh, who use captions actually have no hearing problems at all. And so they're becoming more and more popular. Uh, so why would they use captions? Well, if English is your second language, it can help associate text and audio. Yeah, actually, no, I recommend that to people. Especially if you like watch a movie you already know and you turn on the captions for the language you want to learn, it can really help. And then when you, it might be a good idea to listen to it in French. Mm -hmm. Oh, there you go. That's right. Word association. Well, sometimes they can't understand what you're saying. Yeah, that's true. Especially when native speakers speak very quickly, um, that can be tough. Um, another one is if you have ADD or ADHD, it helps keep people focused. Um, so it makes it easier th to prevent eyes wandering off the screen. So that's a whole chunk of audience that we don't usually even try to map our projects to. But captions can help. With kids, especially for kids' material, they're learning how to read. Um, or a need for lower volume. That's a big one. And also, even if you have no other reason, captions can grab your attention. Because when you're scrolling through a feed, welcome, guys. Um, when you're scrolling through a feed, sometimes a video is set to autoplay. And if there's no 
uh, sound on and there's no captions, you tend to just scroll right by. But sometimes if it starts talking about something that interests you right away, you might actually watch it or turn the sound on. So SEO was the third part, and I was, uh, I was describing a situation where you upload a video to YouTube and you have your title and description, but maybe in your project you talk about much more than what's in that description. And so all the words that get added through your captions become indexed. So if you have a show about dogs, but in the video you talk specifically about German Shepherds, when people search for German Shepherds now, if you have captions, you might actually be in one of their results. So... SEO can be a major portion of why you would do captions and subtitles. But there's be that's all stock footage and you add some text on it you've made a video without needing to do any other production so that can be good um sometimes i I clarify this in the class because it can be confusing some people think of captions and they think of captioned images so i always say these are not gifs or memes that technically although is called a caption isn't sort of the kinds of captions we're thinking about right now um and more importantly when you're creating captions i try to steer people away from things Man. Oh, oh, oh. Seriously, seriously, is this really happening? Stop it with these white bars on the top of videos! Stop overusing emojis and freaking clickbait titles! That perfectly describes how I feel about videos that look like that. <laughs> I think the only thing worse is, is uh, and actually now it's, it's even almost okay in some situation, vertical video, Instagram stories and other stories type situations have made vertical video much more of a thing. Um, but when I started teaching this class, I was always like, no vertical video. But now with Instagram, you kind of have to. So captions versus subtitles. Let's talk about the difference. We tend to think of them used sort of interchangeably, but they're actually very different things. So captions we're used to seeing with a logo kind of like this, which represents closed captions, which we typically think of uh, as far as hearing impairments, the deaf community, hearing loss. Um, And the reason for that is because those captions are a little bit different. You look at things like this and the caption actually says a sound, right? So sound effects, off camera actions, things that uh, aren't just spoken word, right? Sound effects and other ones like you hear music playing. So these are captions as far as, uh, what they specifically do. They're designed the same way. You build them essentially the same way, but how, what you put in there can, can make a big difference. Um, let's talk about open versus closed captions. Um, we're used to the term closed captions. In fact, even when I send marketing material to, to things, it, it usually jumps to saying closed captions because that's the word we know. But closed captions is actually just a type of how it's applied, which is in this case, a uh, closed caption, I got my laser pointer here, um, is a separate file. It means it's something that you can turn on and off. You can choose whether those captions play. Open captions are kind of like that Tylenol video we saw a second ago where it's burned in. It's there forever. There's nothing you can do about it without editing the original video itself. So open captions, it's locked in. And actually, you get some design options with that. You can choose whatever color you want. You can decorate it, put them wherever on the screen you want. But closed captions are based on the player. So YouTube will have some control over what the font looks like, things like that. It's more about text documentation versus design. So, for example, this is uh, on YouTube. They have the closed caption button where we can turn it on and off. So that would represent a closed caption. We can change it. We can actually even change uh, the font. YouTube now has font options. You can choose the size, um, which can be really good. They don't have options like that on on mobile devices, just on the website. On YouTube, it does. No, not when you're playing them back. Yeah, the viewer can make whatever changes they want. Um, well, a lot of people, yeah, especially the older community too. Um, if you need to increase the size, some people have. I've had uh, students that I was teaching about um, other tech-related things, and their monitors are like massive, like that big, just to see for their home computer. And uh, yeah, it lets people keep enjoying media. So subtitles. If captions are mostly for the deaf and hard of hearing community, subtitles are more or less for 
uh, call it everything else in a way, um, specifically for foreign language is usually how they're used. So while we have things that are pretty much the same, we can take out things like laughs or music begins uh, and just stick to the words and then allow those to be translated to other languages. Um, as I was saying earlier, I have a project that does much better in France than it does in the U.S., even though it's in, uh, it's in English, the French subtitles let it match their more enjoyed niche of film. So sometimes just changing the language can be nice. Uh, but usually don't include sound effects or music. It assumes that the person can hear. They just want a visual as well. And they're usually used for foreign language. So which is better? What should you do? Um, I usually say both. Because it's pretty easy. If you create captions, all you have to do is just duplicate that document and delete the parts about sound. So if you plan to do both and you, you do all of your, if you think about it as captions, basically start with that and then just remove the parts that are unnecessary. When you come to upload those to YouTube, Vimeo, wherever you have your, your, um, your video displayed, uh, you can upload them as separate files or in most cases you can just upload the captions. Most people who view it don't have a problem seeing captions, but if you can't hear the project and then there are big chunks that don't have anything just because there's only music playing, um, it can be really irritating for people who can't hear your project. So I, I say if you have to choose, go with captions. If you don't have to choose, do both. And also, too, if you guys have any questions at any time, feel free to just ask. This is just a, I'm only using the microphone for the, for the video recording, but this is, this is just kind of a group workshop. Um, so working with clients, this is kind of a new slide that I added recently. How many of you do editing or production for other people? Okay, you do. You do. Um, if you're editing things and delivering for clients, um, you can do it one of two ways. You can either charge them for captions or you can make it a perk. Uh, I make it a perk. I, anything under 30 minutes, I caption for free. And that sounds like a lot of work. It's really not that much work. But the reason I do it is part because it's a nice bonus for the client. But second, it's another way I can advocate. And I try to get those clients to, to advocate further as well. So I'm big into advocate. I got my buttons. You guys will get a button. If you take the pledge at the end, I have a pledge. So uh, I am in the middle of making it, but you can also just do a quick write-up as to why it's important and just hand them a document that says, here's some reasons why it would be good to caption. Or there's nothing wrong if you want to charge for it. It's an extra service you can offer. So creating your own captions just for you, for your own projects. There's a couple of options you could do. These are the FCC rules. Does anybody know if there are any of the differences between the state's FCC rules or Canada's rules? Is there anything specific? Okay. So what we're going to do is go with the FCC rules because actually the FCC doesn't really have many rules. They're just guidelines. So I would recommend these guidelines to anywhere, any, any time. So first one is that they should be accurate. Right. If the person on camera says, hey, what are you doing tonight? Say you don't want the caption to be like, what's up tonight? You want to make sure that your captions are accurate because it's amazing what can be lost in either translation if you're doing foreign subtitles or um, just even as part of the story. So I always keep it accurate. I want to make sure it's synchronous. Synchronous meaning that the captions display as the person is saying those things. Um, sometimes that can be tricky depending on your project. If people speak very quickly or uh, if they're very long-winded, it can be tough. But always do your best to make it as synchronous as possible. So the text lines up when they start saying that phrase and ends when they, when they stop. Yeah. I've noticed a couple times where I've had mixed captions. Uh-huh. There are some reasons, um, and I'll, exp I'll, I'll, exp I'll come back to that in a minute for sure, because there is one reason in particular specifically about um, open captions and closed captions in the same situation, which usually happens a lot with news footage where they have subtitles along the bottom saying, like, you know, there's your little um, ticker along the bottom. And sometimes to make sure that ticker gets read and the subtitle gets read, they'll, they'll make them slightly asynchronous um, so they don't cover anything. But usually off, out of sync subtitles or captions is an accident most of the time. Uh, but there are, there are some situations where that's beneficial. They need to be complete. Um, I have seen, and this breaks my heart, I have seen projects where the first 20 minutes of the movie is captions and then they gave up. <laughs> they got bored or 
till the end. There's just no more captions. It was just really sad. So you could not, if you were to, if you were to pitch your pilot to ABC and they pick it up, you'd have to finish those captions because the FCC wouldn't let you broadcast it. Amazon's actually the same way now. If you get anything picked up by Amazon, they follow the FCC guidelines. Uh, and they have to be properly placed so they don't, shouldn't block anything else. Kind of going back to that example, that's the situation where that can override the sync, the, how in sync they are. So a lot of times, especially with action movies, it'll be like Seattle, 1995, right? And, but you hear a voiceover talking at the same time. Sometimes what they'll do is they'll wait for that Seattle 1995 to go away and then they'll bring in the text because covering things can be a big problem, especially with open captions because it's just a mess. Closed captions, sometimes it's unavoidable, but yeah. So some of these you have to just kind of like, that's sort of why there are no steadfast, you're in trouble, you broke the rules. They're just, these are just the best guidelines they come up with. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that happens a lot. And then the the reverse happens a lot, too, where the the person doing the captions actually took the effort to say, you know, they have a subtitle down here, so I'm going to put the captions up top. The captions I'm going to teach today are based on the SRT file type, which is something that anybody can do. It doesn't let us do things like location placement, which I'll talk about, though, but it's not something I can teach in this one because it takes more advanced software and more... um, it's a little more expensive to do. But yes, sometimes it's a mess and it's all over the place. And sometimes they, like, they'll have like one character's captions over here and one character's captions over here. And these are all just sort of fancy things that people can do with it. Um, and it just comes down to the quality of the person doing the, doing the captions as to how they turn out. Yeah. So that's essentially the, the most basic form of rules you'll find. As far as formatting which we're going to talk about a lot, like with sound effects. Do you use flat brackets or parentheses? There's no hard rule for that. And every network has their own style guide. Uh, Any writers or editors are familiar with the idea of a style guide, which is these are the rules for how we want you to write something out. There really is no standard style guide. Um, There are plenty of recommendations. But the main rule, and we'll talk about this later, is keep it consistent. Whatever you decide, don't change it up in the middle of the video. Just keep it going. So some do-it-yourself tools. Uh, We're going to talk about YouTube because YouTube is a very, very commonly used project for both fiction and nonfiction. Uh, The first thing I will say is never, ever, ever accept the auto-generated captions, ever, ever. Uh, Delete them. Unpublish them, delete them. They are horrible and will actually hurt you in search engine optimization because if they start putting in incorrect rules or words, you start being found under the wrong things and you lose the ability to be found under the things relative to your project. So toss them. I want, I wish I could fully agree with that. And I'm not disagreeing with you because you're right. That it, they are a starting point. You can edit. Um, you can edit them. The problem with editing them is that you, uh, a lot of times the timing's off too. So it can be more work to go in and edit those than it is to actually start with a fresh document. And I'll show you some really quick and simple tools to do it, and you'll see why going the editing route can actually be a little more work. But you're right, and I like that they are getting people into it. This leads me to, I love this video. I wish they would let me license this video, but I can only use it in my class. Um, Have you guys ever heard of Rhett and Link? From, uh, they do, yeah, they're, they're a good series and they do this thing called Caption Fails. Time for another Caption Fail video. This is when we use YouTube's audio transcription tool, which doesn't always do the best job translating. You write a script, act it out, then upload it, let the tool translate it, then make that into a script, act it out, upload it, then let that be made into a script. Here are all three scripts acted out back to back to back. We put the exact words of what the computer told us to say on the screen. Enjoy. That's different. I was taking a lot of pain medication for my herniated disc and my judgment was clouded. Well, what are you going to do about it? I'm going to take this fist right here and punch you in the face. You wouldn't dare. Let's do that again. That's different. I was taking a lot of indication. Argue disconnected flat. What are you going to do about it? Undertake. This describes fractionally touch. You want to get... Does it again. That's different technology indication. Argued, disconnected, axe. Witty and all that? 
undertake this discourse actually types. You'll forget. There's a big hit. So that's kind of why I advocate not using the the uh, thing. I wish it was better since the video was made, but sadly it's not at all. Um, so yes, I mm, I wish I had a recommendation for automatic uh, transcription. I really wish I did. I have tried everything I can find that will listen to your audio and type it out for you, even poorly. I've even looked for ones that do a bad job. I have held my phone out having, uh, you know, playing the video and letting Siri on my computer try it. I've tried Google, uh, Google's words. I've tr- tried everything I can think of and nothing lives up to what I hope for. So one way you could do it if you don't want to type all this out, you can uh, hire out. That's not too expensive just for transcriptions. I'll also show you later how to hire out for captions. But for now, I'm sad to say we don't have an automatic tool. Um, but this leads me to YouTube's auto timing feature. <clears throat> and the key, honestly, the keynote's really just to keep me on track. So th- some things are interesting, but for the most part, it's just telling me what, you, what to tell you. So auto timing, um, it does do a pretty good job of figuring out where things go if you know what is being said. So instead of worrying about where your start and stop points are for any portion of text, you can just type it out. I usually say about 50 characters a line. Type it out. Upload it as a transcript to YouTube, not as a captions file, and let YouTube do the timing. And that actually is pretty good. There, you still got to check it. You might have to change a few things. But if you want to save a little time, you can just do it as pure text, upload it to YouTube as a transcript, and let it separate the timing. So that's pretty good. Yeah. Did you have a question? You know, I haven't tried Microsoft Translate. That's one I haven't tried. Yeah, I, I haven't used Word in a while, but it's worth going back and looking at it. I will track that down. Thank you. Yeah, that will be great to try. Thank you. Um, this is an example of how to upload a caption file. Or I'm sorry, not how to upload how to create it. Because YouTube itself actually has the tools built right in. You don't need any other software. Once you upload your video, you come into the captions area of your video clip, um, however long it is. But I want you to watch something. This video is actually sped up quite a bit. Because these tools, although wonderful in theory, are not very effective in use. So if you have nothing else, if you have to do it and you're out on the go and you have no other tools with you, but you can access this, it's something you can do. But it is definitely not easy to come in and apply uh, captions in YouTube itself. I wish it was. If you're just going to upload your caption file... You can actually go right up to the caption section of YouTube uh, the, in the video cur- creator area where your video is. Go to edit, and then you can choose captions and subtitles, and you can choose what language you're adding your caption file in. This is if you already have it. Um, and basically, you, just, you can do this as many languages as you want. You were talking about doing multilingual things. You can have tons of files. And this is, there are two types, transcript, which has no time code. And subtitle files, which are usually, uh, in this case, we're going to talk mostly about SRT files. Um, Once you find my file, sorry, it's taking so long. Once you find your SRT file and you connect it to that video, it'll show you the same way as if you'd created it within YouTube itself. And this is where you can also make further adjustments. If you realize, oh, I have a typo, then you can go in and fix it right within YouTube. I have one client who only uploads to YouTube. I do captions for her, and I go ahead and I upload the captions privately. She reviews it, and if she sees any typos, she knows how to fix them, or she can ask me to fix them. But I don't go and do the document again. I just go to YouTube and make a couple minor typo fixes. Why do you do that? It's easier than going back to the original document, editing the original document, removing this this published version, and then re-uploading a new published version. If it's just a couple things like an apostrophe or a comma, then I'll just go right to YouTube, right in this little window, fix that comma, and I'm good. So, so that's, that's assuming that it's never going to be used anywhere else except for the... Yes, that only works in YouTube, yeah. And she only uploads to YouTube. She doesn't put it anywhere else. So that's just specific to that client. If I had a thing where it was uploaded to three platforms and somebody found a typo, I would absolutely go back to the document and I'd republish to each of the different platforms for sure. 
So uh, this is actually, sorry, it jumped ahead. YouTube now has recently, they have added the ability to purchase captions on your video. You can have um, a professional company translate it into any language that you want. And it's actually not that expensive depending on what what you're looking for because some of it is dependent on the language and the speaker of that language and who's doing those captions. But you can see for this two-minute video, depending on how it's done and who's charging me for it, I can do that. I think that was like a two-minute, 45-second video or something, and that would cost me 17 bucks to have it done professionally with full captions. So it's not that bad considering most series episodes are anywhere from five to 10 minutes. I'd probably ballpark you somewhere from $25 to $60. That's US, uh, but it's similar. There are also, com- this just takes you to a link to that company. It's not YouTube doing it. They just have uh, firms that have signed up with YouTube to do that. So basically you're getting bounced to a third party company who will do this, send it back to you, you confirm and then go from there. So that's an option. That's one way to do it. That's not necessarily how I tell indies to do it because we know what it's like to work on a budget. I always say do it yourself. It's much cheaper. Or uh, has anybody ever heard of a website called Fiverr? Fiverr is pretty fantastic. If you have an F-I-V-E-R-R.com, people offer to do things for $5 and there are quite a few captioned people on there. Always check their work. (laughs) Uh, Vimeo, man makes me so sad vimeo doesn't have any built-in tools but they did for a little while and it wasn't that great anyway so vimeo's options are essentially just to upload a caption file you have to create elsewhere but it's in the advanced section and maybe in basic now Uh, i know they changed it recently i'll have to look again but it was in the advanced section so it may still be there where you basically just go and choose choose what file you want to upload to your video it's the exact same process as youtube except a different menu option once it's uploaded, you choose what language it is, whether it's a caption or a subtitle. Um, and from there, you're good. So uploading these is really, really easy. What we're about to start doing is talking about how to make them. Um, Amara is another tool. This is actually the tool Vimeo used to be contracted with. Uh, Amara is, I, I kind of like this because you can caption anything, even if it's not yours. You can go to any video uh, that's on YouTube or Vimeo and plug in the link, and they'll give you the tools necessary to uh, create captions for that video. So the question is, why would you do that? Why would you go and caption someone else's work? I'll give you some reasons later, but it's in, for the most part, this is a tool you can use to caption your own work. But there are reasons to do it for other people. So same process, but what I want you to see here is the editor that they use. They use a slightly different workflow. Basically, what they do is they have you listen and transcribe first. They tell you ignore the timing. So you just type it out in small chunks, something that would look okay at the bottom of the screen. And once you have typed it all out, the next step, phase two, is to go through and time it. So instead of like YouTube's workflow um, and some of the other workflows that are more common, this is sort of a two-step process. So then, sorry, I should. I always think I should speed up this. I do like that they have some tools here that talk about like checking what the quality it's going to be like. I usually tell people hang out below fifty characters if you can, but it's usually about a third of a sentence. Looks good. So then this would be phase two. You listen to it and you mark in and out points as you would in any editor, <clears throat> and you choose. Uh, yeah, for one line. And there are, it's okay to do two lines. And um, I, when we get to talking about uh, characters per line and how many lines and format and design, um, there are some guidelines that are good to follow. But yes, you can do one line, two lines. It usually depends on the speaker. Like I'm speaking fairly quickly right now, so it would be easier for a reader to see them as two lines. Yeah. But if someone's slow and it's, you know, there's stuff far, uh, few and far between, it can save you time. So Mac and PC software... The one I'm going to recommend today, I only recommend because it was like $4, and it has a really nice workflow. That's for Mac. Um, but there are tons of them. There's one called Camtasia. It used to be just a plug-in for Flash video streaming, but it actually has become a pretty powerful captioning tool. Um, the thing about Camtasia, though, is it's expensive. It's like 300 bucks, but it does lots of other things. So if you're interested in it, it's worth it. If you were to do this as plain text, this is what a caption would look like as plain text. All the software we're talking about does all this for you a little prettier, but 
essentially, if you were to do it as a text document, what you would have is the start time code and the end time code first with this arrow uh, in between. And then you would type out what happens in there. This would be a two-line uh, two line subtitle. This is a lot of work. I don't recommend it. It's really tough to edit. I always say it's much, much easier to use some of the software that just lets you type away. So, but it's a thing. Some people like to do it as plain text. That's okay too. Uh, SRT style codes. The, I always say use these with caution. Uh, things like bold, italics, underline. You can change a lot of this stuff, just like you could if you were working on a website with basic HTML. I don't recommend it, and the reason I don't recommend it is because not all players, video players, uh, understand it. So sometimes at the bottom, the example, don't go in there, becomes that in bold. If a player doesn't understand it, what you get is what you see on the left. You get the code as well. So it's not very pretty. So I always say use it if you really need to, but make sure that the player you're using, the distributing tool, uh, understands those codes as well. So which should you use? Honestly, whatever makes you feel comfortable. I'm a big fan of offline software like uh, because if I'm on a flight, that's a great time to do captions. Um, and I can't just log into YouTube unless I'm on a flight with Wi-Fi. Um, this is my favorite right now. It's super cheap. It's like five bucks for Mac. Uh, SRT Edit Pro. So if you're a Mac user, that's a good one. I think they were working on a PC version, but I don't know. Um, so let's talk about the basics of what they should look like. This is Now we're getting into the part where we've convinced you that captions and subtitles are worth doing. Now we're talking about how to do them and what they should look like. Color is pretty... A lot of these are just common sense concepts, but I always like to cover them. White on white doesn't really work. So this is from the movie The Island everything was white. So instead of white on white text, and some of these are specific to open captions, because if you do closed captions, the player's going to decide what it looks like. So this would be if you did open captions where you actually burned this stuff in, you put these text, uh, text lines in the editing software that you're using. So I usually say either give them an outline, or this is pretty typical too, where you give it sort of a shaded box around the back. And again, Closed captions, the player's going to decide. Open captions, this is up to you as the editor. Uh, here's some other examples of being able to change what that looks like in YouTube. You can click the little settings guy and choose whatever you want as the viewer. It's not something we can change. I wish we could. And you can if it's open captions. That's sort of why open captions are a thing. So you get to pick. Sometimes, like, uh, anybody see the movie years ago, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World? Um, they did lots of open captions and they, all kinds of crazy designs like lightning and explosions. And, and that's, that's a good reason to incorporate open captions. What's tough, though, is if you're going to do a foreign rights and you're going to do it somewhere else, you have to redo all that editing with the other language. That's the reason I like closed captions so much is you just change the document. You're good. So sometimes they're yellow. Sometimes they're white. Yellow is one because it's not very common. It's kind of like the reason we use green screen. It's not a very commonly used color. Uh, sometimes they're off to the side, which isn't something we usually do with SRT files, but more advanced uh, subtitle files can do that. They usually do it for characters. Uh, that Comic Sans never, please, never do Comic Sans if you're doing open captions. Um, uppercase versus lowercase. Again, most of these are just guidelines, not rules. Um, the most important thing is that you stick to your... Uh, whatever you started with. So if you do lowercase, it's usually recommended you follow typical grammar rules with capitalization. You start a sentence with a capital and you go from there. If you're doing uppercase, which is usually news footage, uh, viewers kind of feel like it's always yelling, but it's still pretty popular for people to do full uppercase. Uh, about 50 characters per line. This is a good example. This is not. <laughs> um, so that's about as much as you want. But again, there's no rule as to how many lines that you have. Um, typically, you don't go over two. Um, so why would you do two lines instead of one? Usually it comes down to, like I was saying, the speed of the speaker. Uh, but in this case, I want you to imagine you're watching a whole movie, 90 minutes, whatever it is. How's my time? Oh, we're good. Uh, 90 minutes of trying to get your eyes all the way to the left, all the way to the right. It can actually be exhausting on your eyeballs. So what is usually done is we start to bring things center so that your eyes don't have to go as far left and right. But when you get like this, it starts to feel a little awkward. So what your goal should be is try to match the, uh, the line length. And again, just guidelines. This is just typically what we do. And if you're splitting it in the middle... 
uh, what you really want is to split it around the phrase. If you were to put a comma in, that's a good spot to do it. So there's no right or wrong, but it's just kind of basic. How would I, where would I split this? I think, would it be a comma or does it need to be more based on the, the direction? Like, uh, I probably wouldn't split it between who are holding the cardboard, but I could say between when I see somebody, you know, those people who are holding the cardboard, I could split it between that too. Again, no right or wrong. You got to use your best judgment. And that's kind of why it starts to become sort of an art form, especially with uh, sound effects. Um, we'll talk about sound effects and off camera things in a minute, but uh, you get to kind of add a little bit more script with this sometimes. It can be fun. Placement, uh, just don't cover anything. This is a really good example of what not to do. Um, when it comes to captions or hard coded captions, which is another way to say open captions versus uh, closed captions where they're flexible. You just want to keep in mind what's on screen at all times. It's easy to focus on the sound and try to write out the sound, but you always want to make sure you're not covering anything else. For identifying characters that are not on screen, <clears throat> typically it's the name, a colon, and then the, the word. If you don't want to identify the character yet, you can use something like male voiceover. Um, sometimes off-screen things are italicized. But again, that's not an SRT trick. That's something else that's uh, different software. But that's something you'll see a lot. So off-camera is typically either if we know the character, we'll see their name. If we don't know the character, it could be something like male voiceover. For sound effects, we always want to do... Uh, this is what you do right here. Sorry. This time uh, is a different demo. Originally, uh, for those who just joined us, I would play the video with no sound and ask you how interesting it was, which is typically not very interesting at all. But I'm going to play the same video, but this time I want you to close your eyes and I just want you to listen. Just pay attention to the sound. This is what you do right here. It's money. It's tacos. <laughs> If you're going to do this, if you're going to panhandle or fly a sign, you need to swallow your pride. I get a lot of compliments with this sign. People are like, that's true, that's true, it is true, you should help me. When somebody says, hey, you work for the mission, um, well, I've got a question. Uh, you might see somebody... You know, so I want you to think about what you heard. What are some examples of things that you heard? Wind, people talking, cars music. Yep. So those are all things that would be completely lost if you couldn't hear them. So how do we describe them to people who can't hear them? This is where I was saying you can kind of keep writing your script a little bit. You could just say guitar music begins, or you could say gentle guitar strumming. And I get the question a lot. Well, if someone was deaf their whole life, how do they know? It's partly respect. And it's partly because it's still more interesting than just seeing guitar music. And so it's, it's, it's a mix, but I, I always try to pretend that if I try hard enough, I can describe it in a way that still makes it enjoyable. That's my goal. I, whether I hit that goal or not, that's my goal. Um, in terms of formatting sounds, uh, things that we can only hear and not see, uh, there are, again, no steadfast rules. Typically, you'll see them either in lowercase and or uh, parentheses. Usually, it's flat brackets. That's pretty common for sound effects. Um, I would definitely attempt to use something better than what I wrote here. Guitar music begins. This was just a, an example. I would say something like, uh, you know, gentle guitar strumming or whatever, how, however you can think to describe it. Just think of making it interesting. Um, cars rushing by. Some people look at that and say, that's obvious. Well, it's only obvious if you can hear it too. Rushing, the word rushing almost sounds a little bit like traffic noise. So sometimes it's a, it's a thing you can try to take further beyond your script. <laughs> Some people hide things um, in their projects, and sometimes that's a little Easter egg that you can find. Uh, sometimes they're italicized, but that's pretty rare. And sometimes they're uppercase. That actually is pretty common. Uh, uppercase sound effects, even if you're using a lowercase theme, is, uh, is pretty common. If you have silence and there's nothing, it should be there. Because otherwise it looks like you missed one. So if it says no sound or, you know, you hear nothing or silence. Silence is a good one to use. Uh, it's, it's worth putting in just so it doesn't look like a mistake. 
Netflix goes overboard, though. Uh, they like to do all kinds of funny things. Like, typically, these wouldn't even count as sound effects because they're actually actions. But sadly, go karts. That's a good one. <laughs> so. I don't know why they included these as captions, but Netflix likes to have a lot of fun. If you turn on, they, Netflix also calls it something a little bit different, um, which is SDH. Uh, when you're going to caption, sometimes it'll say SDH, which is subtitles for the deaf and hard of hearing. Um, just something to keep in mind. It's just a third term they made up. Off camera uh, dialogue and sound effects is the same thing, but like I was saying, it's typically italicized. This is a good example here. This is from the last James Bond film, Spectre. Um, and first I want you to watch, we're going to see it a couple times in different ways. I just want you to watch this for a second. You're a kite dancing in a hurricane, Mr. Bond. Wait, I'm going to go back just to make sure we can hear that one because we're specifically paying attention to the sound. You're a kite dancing in a hurricane, Mr. Bond. It's a very intense scene, but watch it again. This file already has no sound, so you're good. Watch it again, this time with no audio. It very quickly goes from thrilling to kind of hilarious. It's two people intensely staring at each other and then she twitches and we have no idea why so that's why you would want to incorporate subtitles or captions for this one but the third version i did bring the sound back so you can relate to what's happening but pay attention to how i did the subtitles in this one you're a kite dancing in a hurricane mr Bond. i wrote it as video recording so long you can see that video recording gunshot was completely synchronous with the caption and that's important because her reaction is completely based on the gunshot so if i put that in even half a second later she's like she twitched oh gunshot that's what it is so it's always something you want to keep in mind going to timing so let's say you're watching a pre-recorded thing of a game show and there's a winner (laughs) you don't want to give away the winner with the caption so uh, you can be off by, you know, I don't know, a word or two. Uh, but also you really only want, you don't want a caption that's any shorter than about a second, right? Any shorter than that, it's impossible to read. Uh, three seconds is usually pretty good, even for single words. So even if the person says, hello, and there's nothing else, leave that hello up for two or three seconds. It's worth it. Because uh, we don't read quite as fast as we speak. Uh, using multiple lines is a great way to keep your timing good. Be very specific. Um, and then going to that idea of a game show, the winner is you want a pause there. Cut your caption. Don't say Joe if it's going to give it away. I can't tell you how. What, you'll see. If you watch with captions, you the joke is given away all the time. The murder suspect is given away all the time, just way in advance of when they actually say it. What you should do with a caption like that, the winner is Joe, is you would say, and the winner is Use your captions to build suspense. Have fun with it. Again, it's part of finishing out your script. Suspenseful music builds. Joe! And then audience applause. Incorporate your sound effects. Incorporate your timing. Make it part of the fun. And always proofread your captions, whether you do them or someone else do them. Or you end up with things like this. Or this one. Or this one, which I'm not going outside today. So it's amazing. These are typically with news organizations because they have to do their captions so fast. Um, But those things kind of escape. Uh, But always make sure that you are ready. So uh, I'm going to actually do a demo of captions. Uh, Questions while I'm kind of setting up a demo. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. How specific do you get? Just go through the whatever that job was. What were the names you wanted? For captions? How do you credit someone who does your captions? How do you do credits in the captions? Those translated credits. 
Um, so any, any text you would get in the, the credits would typically um, override any other credit, credits for captions. Other, I'm not sure I totally understand. But basically, uh, if you already have text explaining one thing, it shouldn't need any other text to further explain it. So you don't have to do... There are situations where, like that, that movie I said where it starts with Seattle 1995. You don't need to also write Seattle 1995 uh, as part of the captions. So, for example, you're talking about like end credits, like scrolling credits? Um, the only time you would need to do captions over end credits is if you have voiceover or further acting happening. Like sometimes comedies will have like bloopers, right? So you'd still have to do captions there. Oh, I see what you're talking about. You're talking about like foreign language subtitles. Okay, got it, got it. Foreign language subtitles. Yes. Typically, uh, you, you have the option of either leaving them the same because job titles sometimes qualify as titles, which technically means you don't have to. If you wanted to, though, and it's up to you as an indie filmmaker, um, you, I would hire, I would say, here's my document of all my credits. And I would find some, a native speaker or a very qualified translator to look through that and say, here is, uh, here's the version that has all the you know, job titles in Spanish. And what you would do is create a new scrolling credits video that you tag on to the end. No. But also, but also because they're titles, you don't really have to. They're job titles. So it's kind of optional at that point. Um, so what I'm going to do here, I'm going to use SRT Edit Pro because it's a, it's a nice, easy thing. Let me switch this over to mirroring so you can see. All right, let me hide my thing. You guys can see that. Okay, so I'm going to give you a really basic idea of workflow. Uh, of how to create captions. Uh, it's actually pretty straightforward. Give me a second to track down. I just did some file restructuring. So give me a second to find my, my demo material here. Keynote Media. Great. Uh, here's that trailer. I'm just going to take it and drop it right into the video field of this. And again, you don't have to fully understand the software. This is just an example of how easy it can be to, uh, to create captions. So one of the reasons I love this program is because of how it displays the waveforms to me. If I play this, this is what you do right here. Notice I get a really clear indication of my timing. It's telling me pretty much exactly where his phrase starts and stops. Um, when I use this software, I'm going to press uh, the, the beginning. There's a little traffic sound, but I'm going to skip that because it's a little too short to put anything in. So I'm making a creative choice here to skip that beginning traffic sound. I'm going to press play. Oh. As he starts to speak, I want to make sure I'm synchronous. So I'm going to jump back a teeny bit right there. And I know that he says, this is what you do right here. When you're creating captions in any program, typically what you have to do is indicate where you're starting point is and where your stop point is. So the first thing I'm going to do is click this button that says insert time code. There's my time code. 99% of the time, time code is based on hours, minutes, uh, seconds, milliseconds. Whereas we're used to as filmmakers, hours, minutes, seconds, frames. I like this software because it keeps me in the frame mentality. If I look at this, it's actually 0.16, meaning 16 frames. But when it exports, it puts it into milliseconds. So that's one of the reasons it's nice to have software help you. Again, if you're a Mac user, this program's five bucks. So there's plenty of other ones. There's free ones. I would definitely uh, explore your options. And you can get trial versions of most things. Uh, something I didn't mention that breaks my heart. How many people use Premiere? Okay, we have Premiere users. Final Cut? Anybody? Okay. The, the professional softwares that we use have little to no captioning tools. They have titling tools, which are great, and that's fine for open captions. Uh, Final Cut got captioning tools a week ago. No, not a week ago. Ten days ago now. It was on the ninth. And they are awful. <laughs> and the Premiere's are even worse. Have you ever tried to use Premiere's captioning tools? Not yeah, it's horrible. They don't even show up. No, they don't. You, like, spend all that time putting them in. Yep. Yep. No, it's terrible. Yeah. You do? Oh, sorry. I hate to say it, but it, it doesn't work. Do you, you work on the captioning section? Okay. 
Yes, I would love to. Please, I want to talk to you. I'll talk to you for hours. No, 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 no. I want to hear it. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's what it feels like. Yeah. It's not good either. Right. And, and even to you, as someone who works with Premier, or works on Premier, I, I would even I would have the same questions because it's it's a the workflows are so different that I don't, you may build all that stuff and people don't pay attention to it. So yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So I'm going to stick with the way I usually pitch it and that, that might help you actually. Okay, cool. So, uh, the workflow that I generally recommend is you wait until your project's finished. Two reasons. One, it's easier. And two, um, if, if somebody goes in and takes out 30 seconds halfway through the project, you would have to retime everything after that 30 seconds. So I usually say captions last, unless you have a client that demands it. Um, but then it's more hours. So typically, the workflow is you play your video, and you find your start point for the captions, and then you enter a time code, and he says, uh, this is what you do right here. I'm going to type that in. That's a pretty good length, right? So I'm pretty happy with that. What I want, uh, grammatically, I'm trying to remember what he says next. That's a period, so I'm going to say period. I'm going to play it again and wait and find out when he's finished. This is what you do right here. Great. He's about to say another phrase, so I'm going to cut it off there. I insert time code again. That tells me that that's how this is going to play. If I go back to the beginning and I play it. This is what you do right here. It's money. Okay. Before we go on, that's how fast it took to make one line of captions. It's not that tough. The document that's going to be created, I can then take and have translated. I can have it sent to other languages. All the text that I'm typing is going to be uh, optimized for search engines. So this is really helpful stuff. If I want to jump right to the very end of that uh, caption and pick up another one, because he says it's money, I can just click that time code. It's one of the reasons I like this software. And then jump to the next line and press return. I'm going to click insert time code again because this is a different line. And he says, it's money. I'll play it. I'll wait till he's done. Money. Pretty good. It's a little short. Let's give it another second. I know he's about to speak. I, I could squeeze in a traffic noise caption. I'm going to choose not to so it doesn't get too muddied. But I'm going to say that's where that phrase ends. So I leave a little bit longer. And I insert time code. Again, there are keyboard shortcuts for this. I'm just giving you visuals. Um, so now let me go back to the beginning. This is what you do right here. It's money. It's tacos. <laughs> so I would just keep doing that. And it really doesn't take that long. I usually say it's about a five to one ratio. If you have a five minute uh, project, probably take you about 25 minutes to pull this off perfectly. Um, if you're quick, this is just one workflow. Some people love to just go through and transcribe the whole thing and then come back and add their time code. That's totally fine too. Nothing wrong with any of that. Um, if I wanted to do the music, let me jump back to where the end of it's money. It's tacos. He jumps right. Yeah, it's a little bit, I'm kind of cutting into that. So keyboard shortcut wise, I can just press my left arrow key to shorten this about five frames or so. And then I'll jump to the next line. Time code again. I know he says it's tacos. What does he do right after he says it's tacos? It's tacos. <laughs> he laughs. So I want to make sure that's in there. So let me jump back to the beginning here. It's tacos. <laughs> Good. Let's make that. Oops, sorry. Jumped to the wrong one. It's tacos. He, that's pretty good. I'll cut that one off there. Next line, click it again. And then laughs. Now, I use my flat brackets. Just you say laughs. It's pretty good for that one. Let's get the laugh. <laughs> but we also have music starting, so we have to think about that too. So I'm going to come back, do it again, and I'll say guitar music. I'm, I'm being terrible with these right now. And also another flat bracket. Guitar music. 
You can see this really doesn't take that. Long. That's pretty good. Done. So let me add another time code. Great. I've already got my first five subtitles built in. And like I said, this is a pretty easy software that would take way longer to do that on YouTube uh, and a lot longer on Amara too, but those are great free tools if you want those. They're also cross-platform because they're web-based. Um, yeah, so this is essentially a quick demo of how you do it. The difference is only you keep doing it for the rest of your project. And that's really all it takes. Does anybody want to try it or have questions about it or want me to keep going or stop there? Yes. Yes. Um, so there are different possible formats for Yep. I can't remember which is which, but I know that Facebook doesn't accept some of the ones that YouTube. Yes. Yeah. So what if you want to translate the kind of file? So great question. There are translators. You can use software to switch from one format to another. Um, the one I pitch in this class every time is always an SRT file. It's not the most advanced. It's the most basic, if anything. It's, it's very limited. Like, you can't even really bold very well. But it's the one that every platform right now accepts. Facebook, YouTube, Vimeo, everything accepts it. Um, I'm hoping as they expand, Vimeo just opened up some more. They do a couple more now. Uh, what was the... Fa Facebook, or not Facebook, Final Cut. Their new tools, they don't even export SRTs. They put out ITTs, which is their iTunes format, which, fair enough, but still... Um, there are probably, last time I looked, there's about 35 file format types. Um, the reason I pitch SRT is because it's the most cross-platform friendly. So you kind of sacrifice features like colors and, and fonts in order to get the cross-platform only have to do it once kind of thing. And can you export with this? Yeah. So when I'm done, what I would do is, uh, we'll assume that I'm finished here, say export SRT file. Um, I would choose where that goes. Desktop is fine. I can name it whatever I want. Let's just say subs. I'll press save. And it creates a document. When I now, this, and this is what it looks like. I want you to see this. Um, going into, let me actually open that text edit so you can see it a little better. So essentially, uh, it numbers your subtitles. It gives you your uh, hours, minutes, seconds, milliseconds, not frames, which is weird, but that's the way it works. Um, and then it breaks it down. Now, if I wanted to fix something, I could. You can use any text editor to edit SRT files. You just have to make sure you, can, you save it back as an SRT file. Some will try to default it to a, a TXT. But as long as you save it as an SRT file, and will say that should be there for some reason, and I save it, and it stays an SRT file, I can work with it in plain text. That's fine. The reason I like software is because it really helps deal with all this time code stuff. And then if you want to burn it in as open captions. Ah, great question. Yes. So two, two parts to that. When you're doing open captions, I really recommend making sure you're really happy with what it looks like. So I usually recommend open captions, especially for something like Instagram or Stories, doing that in your editor, Premiere, Final Cut, whatever it is. So you have some design options and you can see exactly what it will look like when it goes out. However, the same company that makes SRT Edit Pro, where is it? I have it somewhere. Uh, let's just search Burner. Subtitle Burner. Same company makes a program called Subtitle Burner, um, and they let you do exactly what you're talking about, where you take... Uh, tr -tr 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 let me find it here. Sorry. You take any video and you drop it in there and then you add, you import an SRT file that we just made. Uh, there we go. And it lets you modify them a bit with style. You know, I can change the font colors. I can do some things. It's not great, but it works in a pinch. Um, I do recommend if you're going to like go big with open captions on, on something, like Instagram's a great example. It would be great to know exactly what it's going to look like and have some control. So I usually say it's a little better to do that in the editor. Just duplicate your project and make one with titles. Um, but the way you would do that is not with subtitle software. You would do that with your normal title software as if you're doing like the opening titles for a film. Right. Yes. Right. But you, you can, like I was saying, if you already have an SRT file and you have this and you just want to do it quick, 
Yes, you can do that. I can change the style of this to change the size, uh, you know, font size placement. I can move it around. Um, and this gives me an example in my title safe, so it'll tell me what to do. And then I can export that as a movie, and that comes out. I can choose whatever format I want. Uh, and once I'm done, I have a copy of my movie that has those hard-coded into it. And then, yeah, you can upload that. I just tend to think that if I'm going to publish something with open titles, I like to have a little more control over what it looks like. Right. That's all. And then do you know whether, um, like, in more advanced uh, export settings for video files, like, for if you already have Safari um, on your computer, like, say my files in Apple ProRes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well... They have their list of options for th – this program has their list of options for um, exports. But it has a pretty uh, good list. I've been really happy with it. If you're in your editor, though, Final Cut, Premiere, whatever, you get all the same options you would get. Yeah. Other questions? Cool. We're getting through it. I, I'm, I think I'm good on time. I set, set this to mirror, which had a timer on it. But here, one sec. Any other questions while I'm doing this? No, you guys are great. <laughs> All right. Uh, t -t 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 anything else really important? Um, we talked about sound effects. We talked about, yeah, we talked about all this stuff. Okay, so now let's say you decide you don't want to do it yourself. You want to hire somebody. If you want to hire somebody, there are lots and lots of options. Uh, it's nowhere near as expensive as you think. We're used to the idea of like, oh, it costs like $1,000 to do my short film. It's actually not. On average, it's about somewhere between, depending on how high of a uh, f quality firm you get and what they offer, uh, typically it's about somewhere between 2 and $5 a minute. So that's not too bad. 10 minutes short, 20 bucks. You can easily get it for 20 bucks. Um, Amara On Demand, uh, I mentioned them as a tool to use to create your subtitles. Uh, you can also say, you know what? Don't want to do this. Buy. And they'll have someone at Amara do your subtitles for you. Um, I mentioned Fiverr earlier. You can see plenty, plenty of people who are offering to do captions. Again, check their work, check reviews, make sure that you would be happy with what you get. But if not, it's five bucks. I say it's worth giving it a try. Um, but some people will do up to 10 minutes, and that covers most short films. Uh, interns, man, I feel bad how many people take advantage of interns. Don't take advantage of interns. Interns are okay, but it's not just free labor. I only take on interns for captions if I'm actually going to teach them. If I'm going to give them this class and look over their shoulder and help them, like I'm teaching them how to do captions for themselves. That's the only time I use interns. Um, they're up here. Uh, do you guys have heard of Ben Dobbins? So Ben Dobbins is here. Uh, he's helped a lot with the Vancouver Web Fest. Um, he also uh, runs something called Zoe Zombie Orpheus Entertainment. They do have a lot of fantasy stuff. And they have crazy, crazy fans, like wonderful fans that are really into what they do. And their fans offer to, like, do their subtitles for them. That's great. Again, always check their work. But don't ask fans. Don't put your project out going like, hey, fans, hey, you want a subtitle or caption this? No, it's not worth it. You really do get what you pay for. Uh, any Redditors in here? Fans of Reddit? Yeah. Okay. So if you haven't checked out Reddit, I almost say avoid it because it sucks all your time. But there is one subreddit called uh, Caption Please. And this is a very beautiful thing. Um, basically, it's people who can't hear but have a really intense interest in a video of some kind um, that has not been captioned. And they will post a link to that video and people who can hear will go in and caption it for them. So it's sort of a crowdsourced captioning tool. And it's, um, I, I love looking through it and seeing how happy people are to do that for others. So that would be a reason. It's also great practice. So if you want some captioning practice, great way to do it. And a lot of times those use Amara. So non-English subtitles. Well, what if you don't speak another language, but you want to do it? I mentioned the project that of mine that does better in France uh, than in the U.S., the way I did that is not this guy specifically, but I went to Fiverr. I sent him my subtitles document, my SRT file document, and I said, look, leave all the numbers there. Can you just translate and replace the text for me? I sent him that SRT file document, and he sent me back in two days the whole thing in French. And it cost me 25 bucks to have my 90-minute total series in French. You can do that in anything you want. If you don't want to do that, if you don't want to pay anything for it, you can do this trick which is hit or miss, 
you were talking about Google Translate earlier and words translate tools. Yeah, Microsoft Translate tools. You can copy and paste from your English version into that. It'll keep the numbers mostly the same. You just have to make sure you didn't get any hiccups. Um, what I usually recommend with this, have a disclaimer as your very first caption saying foreign language captions provided by Google Translate. If you see an error, please let me know. This is a, a somewhat trashy way to do it. But if you want to do it quick and you're like, man, I have to get this out to Italy, it works. But be, it's, it, it, a lot of it depends on the, the, the project, too. Because I had a friend who had very pretty, pretty plain English uh, copy, and it was great. And then someone else had a lot of medical copy, and it was, ooh, it was bad. So sometimes it depends on the copy. But yes, you could, with caution, I always say have it checked. Um, but it is free. So, this is the official Q&A. If there is any, I'm wrapping up my stuff. Have I convinced you that captions are worth it? Okay, cool. Uh, it's a little bit of work or a little bit of money, but nowhere near as much work or money as people usually think it is. I also have my buttons. So, for coming to my class, you get a button. Because uh, part of this is not just teaching you how to do captions. It's about getting you to advocate for it. So, I wear the button all the time. Um, I just I try to get people like, talking about it. And interested in it. So, questions? Yes? That is a good question. Um, that's, when it comes to captions, that's a relatively new thing. So, I'll have to look that up. I don't have an answer for that. I mean, I would definitely say captions, I would include subtitles um, individually. I don't know. I don't know if there is like an official one. We'll have to look. That's a good question. Yeah. Other thoughts? Interesting anecdotes? Oh, no. You, have to, you, take, you guys have to take the pledge. I have a pledge. All right, you ready? Okay, repeat after me. I. You don't, you don't have to say it, but you don't get a pen if you don't say it. I now understand the importance of captions and subtitles. And hereby promise to include them in my work. Nobody's going to get a pen. I don't hear anything. No, it's fine. You can get a pen. Uh, for both past and future projects, and to advocate that importance to my fellow filmmakers. So I, I always tell people, don't just go caption your work. Go get other people to caption their work, too. Because it, even if you can hear your project um, in the language that you made it, not everybody can. So whether it's opening up your audience to the deaf and hard of hearing community, to foreign language speakers, or just for search engine optimization, I think it's worth it. So that's it for me. Thanks. Hashtags. Oh, hashtags, yeah. Thank you. Is there a good one? It's just closed captions. Closed captions, yeah, that's a good one. Captions. Most people don't know what open captions are, so I wouldn't think that would be a... There's a few of them, but most of them are just, um, when I go through Twitter at least, I don't know what it is for Instagram because I haven't got there yet, but mm -hmm. it's, you know, sometimes there's like, yeah, accessibility would be good. Um, closed caption, Americans with disabilities, but... Yeah, those would be good. There's no other... After I made the buttons, I found out, like, a month later, there was somebody who goes by iHeart subtitles. So you could look at... They probably have... Um, they probably post a lot of hashtags with theirs. Yeah. So I'm going to hang out as long as I, I think I have to get out. I'm not sure what the timing is like, but I definitely want to talk to you. I want to talk to anybody who wants to talk to me. And if you want a button, you're welcome to a button. Thank you.